Hi there! In the previous episode, we installed the electric engine in the car and connected it with the axle and finished the retractable footboard. In this video, we're gonna finish all the steel work so that we can finally work on the outside appearance. First, we decided to make the slide inside door. Of course, it's gonna be electrified. Later, we're gonna run it in parallel with the retractable footboard. How is it gonna work? After you press the button or the sensor sends a signal, the door starts opening and simultaneously the footboard comes out. Two footboards in this case. Basically, Nick has been working on the door frame for this whole time, trying to solve the jigsaw puzzle of parts from different cars. Of course, there are no out-of-the-box solution with the sledge runners, but we have our wits and welded machine and a chop shop a block away. After just two neat days, we have this structure. Basically, it's a simple reinforced square, since the bulk of the car will be transparent. We decided not to reinforce it diagonally. And finally, the first fitting. It's quite great for the first fitting. We finished the frame of the side door. We used 30 by 30 shaped pipes to create the frame so that while we glass the car, no elements, no runners will be visible outside. We installed them like this. The top one is the side runner from a gazelle van. The bottom one is the side funnel from MIDI. This is a MIDI. There's also a top one from Gazelle over here. Hey, didn't you have any other vans? Only Gazelle and MIDI, is that it? We had only them. Mercedes Sprinter is a nice van. Too expensive. But Gazelle has one great advantage in comparison with Mercedes, Isuzu and others. That all its funnels, the top, the middle, the top, the middle and the lower ones, they are all removable, they are not part of the body, that's why we use the gazelle. There's a lot of them, you can easily buy them new, they are easy to maintain, to buy parts. As a result, the door opens perfectly. Will the drive be electric or mechanic? Electric, using an electric engine with a remote. We're gonna install traps over here, they'll catch the door when it closes. And it's gonna fit the same holes every time. We're gonna install a lock here and the electric drive up here. Hey, it doesn't make any sense. The physics won't allow you to do it this way. Because to push the door, keep in mind that each van has the drive in the middle and you're gonna install it up there. So if your drive pushes only the top part of the door, the lower part will go in the opposite way diagonally. What's the conclusion? The door will jam. That's not it, guys. This is not right. Damn, you're making me use my tools again. My nano machine hands. Where are my gloves? Give me that. Here we go. In the end, Valera had to do some fine tuning, after which we can move on. In addition to the hard work on Cybervan, we have many other projects. Now I want to tell you about our unique project. We received another pack of parts. This time it's electric drive for the door. We decided not to make anything up. We used an out-of-the-box solution, which is often used in shuttle vans, commuter buses. Let's unpack and see what we've got. This is a tooth bar. The engine is gonna move here. There's some electric spaghetti. And this is the engine itself, I guess. Yeah, 
It doesn't look very nice, but we're gonna redo the frame. We just need a working mechanism. The pack includes a slide, some electric spaghetti again, a control panel, a trinket and some small metalware. Buttons, bolts, screws, rivets. Now we're gonna install it to see how it fits. But my guess is that it's not gonna fit and we'll have to do it all over again. As Nick predicted, we have to do it all over again. But going forward, I should know that we had to redo it only once and by our standards it doesn't even count. So, it's almost like doing it right on the first try. I rewelded this hinge, moved the pin this way a little bit, so that the door stays in place, but opens this way. We made a rough connection to the engine. For now, without remote, without other parts, just to see if it works. Let's make the first launch. It works, it's moving. So far, it works via the button, no remote, just a test launch directly from the battery. Well. It seems to be working. Later, when we install the control panels, all the magnet things, the traps which will catch it and guide it to the gaps. That's it. The mechanism works, it's finished. Now we just need to work on the connection and the casing. We're gonna replace the casing, because this one is out of place here. Here is another package for us. This is power trunk lid release from Toyota RAV4. We're gonna install it on the van. Let's unpack it. This is what it looks like. Let's try to plug it in. We need to move it up and down to learn the upper and lower position. And then we have fitted to the van so that the lid opens wide enough. We also have these hinges, these joints from MIDI. Now we're gonna fit it, cut it, sew it and weld it. So here's the reason why we decided to use these Toyota electric shock absorbers. Simple. This was the only pre-owned option of a fitting size and for a reasonable price. What is the idea? Since we're building a cyber van, we're trying to include more electronic devices and other mechanisms that are implemented in modern cars by manufacturers. This is exactly what Nick is doing. So, I should probably explain how the system of opening the trunk will work. Our RAV4 shock absorbers. Here we had to break down the factory spin closing to turn the bolt coupling the other way. That's why we put a hose clamp temporarily. Later we're gonna make a few tack welds and put a factory rubber on. To make it work, we need trunk lid locks. We used Seat Toledo trunk lid locks. They were really easy to buy, and most importantly for us. It has a lock for the central lock. For opening, we're gonna use the simplest actuators, which you can buy anywhere. A regular central lock actuator system. We're using the locks for shock absorber to close the door by itself, to lock it. And powered shock absorbers stop working and remain in an expanded state. There is a spring, a lid screw, and its default state is expanded. That's why if you just empower it, the door will open. That's why. When the shock absorber closes the trunk lid, the lid has to be locked. And to make it all open simultaneously, we need a shared signal. One signal for two actuators. And it's gonna open it. Later, the speed of opening and other parameters will be controlled by our electronics. But we'll see how it goes later, when we're gonna combine all the car parts into a signal ecosystem. Of course, we need to test and adjust all these mechanisms. Fix bugs. Frankly speaking, we're dealing with setbacks and pitfalls almost every time. We finished all the mechanical parts of the trunk, installed the shock absorbers. We installed locks, lock actuators. This is a temporary wiring via spaghetti from a regular 12 volts power unit to the bottom. Later, it will be integrated into the entire system of the van. 
we can wire it properly now because we're gonna have more power consumers. It will change. It's a rough wiring to check if it works so that we can focus on the other things. For now, we open it by pressing the button. Here it goes up automatically by itself. We can get it higher. It gets pretty high. It closes like this. Like this, it's locked. That's it. Later, the speed and height of the doors opening will be adjustable. But we'll have a program to do it. We're not doing it now, because it's just a model, so that we can focus on glass panels and all the other things. And now, let's move on to the fun part. The idea is to create a cyber van from the future and control it via joystick. Of course, there's no out-of-the-box solution for that. That's why we both a steering rack and a separate electronic power assist. Actually, that's what Nick is busy with. We received all the parts to install the van steering system. We've decided to use a steering rack. This rack is from Toyota RAV4. The van is quite large, so we tried to find a strong rack from a big car. A dry one, without hydraulic system, because we're gonna install an electronic power assist. The power assist is from Renault Clio 3. The car is small, but the assist is quite reliable and strong. I'll show you a bit later how we're gonna install it and plug it in. To connect all the parts, to integrate it into the van, we're gonna use steering universal joints. This is Renault Clio's power assist. This joint is from RAV4 steering rack. We also ordered this steering rod extension pieces from Machinists. The rod of the steering rack itself. To transfer the axis of steering rod balls to the axis of both levers. To avoid parasitic oscillations in the suspension. We're gonna use the standard steering rod ends from MIDI. To connect them to the steering links, we ordered these transfer sleeves. These dust caps are temporary. We also made a crude set of mount into the body. We're gonna adjust it more accurately when it's installed. First of all, we fit the modified steering rack and measure it to figure out what the mounting is gonna be. The next step is to figure out the anchors and other pieces that will help us install it all on the van. This part is pretty clear. The metal is thicker, we have to weld more to fit over and over again. We installed the rack where it's supposed to be. We tried to install it as close to the axis of the ends as possible so that these joints were on the axis of the levers. The steering links are parallel to the levers. We used Isuzu factory rod ends. We ordered this twist from Machinist as well. I'm glad that screw threads on the Toyota RAV and Isuzu steering rods are the same. 
That's why we didn't have to weld. We just ordered these sleeves. We combined two joints from RAV4 and from Clio 3. They are already connected to the steering power assist. Here you can see clearly why we used these extension rods. To move the ball from here to here to the axis of the levers. So that when levers work, the alignment remains the same. We connected the joints from RAV4 and Clio 3 steering racks. We connected it just to check. We're gonna weld it and reinforce them later. As I said before, the connection of this power assist is quite ordinary. We plug in the plus and the minus to the battery in the control plus from the ignition switch. That's it. Let's put it on the plus. Here, there was a click. This means that the power assist works. That's it. Now it's much easier to steer. It works. The steering is quite easy. The angle of the wheels are quite wide. This is the angle we managed to achieve. It's pretty wide. We're gonna explain later why we installed the power assist on the right side. Here's our step motor. It will guide the steering. I already installed the transfer sleeve in it. We prepared a few plates. We're gonna install them. I combine our engine and the steering shaft that comes out of the assist. We created this veneer sleeve. We cut off the axis and cut the veneer from the sleeve. That's it. Now we have this sleeve that will be connected to the engine. We adjusted it to the tab. In the end, after installing the stepped motor, we created this system, the stepper received a sign off from the joystick. It learns which way and how fast it should turn the wheels. Of course, the stepped motor won't do it by itself. That's why it's connected to the rack via the power assist. Let's test our system. We have Arduino, joystick, and stepper's driver. The 12V battery powers the steering assist. The power unit powers the stepper's driver. Now we're gonna turn it on, let's see how well we can steer. Okay, here's the limit, let's turn it the other way. Great, full range. It's not the final version, we're gonna have a program with an encoder that will monitor the turning number, the central position of the wheels and other stuff. And some news from the workshop about Volgati. Therefore, in the next couple of months we will reach a milestone and share it with you. Like, subscribe, ring the bell and comment this video. Thank you for watching and catch positive attacks from the axe.